Hello and welcome to part four in our series about expedition yachts. In this part, I was gonna dive right into uh, new build expedition yachts, but in talking to people um, that uh, get comments from on uh, the yacht channel and my own clients and even some of my friends in the marine business, um, I think that there, we, we, we need to talk about some real fundamentals about why people get onto a boat and head off over the horizon uh, out of sight of land to go someplace and what they plan to do. This invites a uh, broader discussion about what the mission is. That mission defines the vessel and there are classes of vessels for different missions. And once we've had uh, hopefully a brief discussion about that, it will frame the conversation back to what vessels uh, are appropriate for converting into expedition yachts. Mm. Some years ago I was tasked with a uh, 85 meter design that was being done by Rolls-Royce Marine in Alessand, Norway. At that time Rolls-Royce Marine was designing, building and managing uh, hundreds of naval warships and commercial vessels uh, all around the globe and they had not done a yacht before and so uh, we had to get down to the basics of what a yacht's mission was. So we talked about the fact that the yacht would be uh, probably in a marina 25 to 35 weeks of the year. When it would go to sea, it would have probably a maximum of 16 guests on board. Twice a year, the vessel would be expected uh, to cross the Atlantic to go over to the Caribbean and back, and that was a 4,000 nautical mile trip. The kind of endurance uh, that it would need would probably be uh, two or three weeks at the absolute maximum in terms of uh, food supplies and waste and uh, uh, fuel on board the vessel. Most of the people in the meeting came out of commercial or military marine and basically uh, the group just started laughing. They were laughing. They were laughing because uh, the mission of an 85 meter yacht is uh, so low in terms of their standards of endurance, range, number of people on board, the kind of sea conditions that we experience would be expected. I told them that if there was severe weather, uh, the vessel would normally not be leaving the port, particularly with guests or owners on board, and that uh, in terms of doing a transatlantic, uh, they probably also would not uh, undertake that in any kind of severe weather conditions. So let me show you the sort of uh, vessel that they were used to designing. It. Here I am standing on the helipad uh, that sits atop uh, an offshore construction vessel that was designed by Ulstein in Norway and built in the United States. This helipad, I assume, is well over 100 feet wide. Pulling back a little bit, you can see we're actually about uh, 10 decks up, over 100 feet up from the water line. So this sort of vessel crosses oceans. It uh, is DP3. It has three separate engine rooms. Any of those can be knocked out and it's still completely functional. So on board uh, for months at a time at sea, it has to have hospitals and gyms. Not only would it have spares, but there are workshops on board to make major repairs and stay on station and get the job done. So indulge me here as we have a little macro discussion. You've probably seen these sorts of uh, graphics for airlines going all around the world. Well, this is uh, marine traffic and they track all the uh, significant sized vessels, including yachts, and fishing boats and tugboats all around the world. The green ones are cargo ships, the red ones are tankers, the brown ones are fishing vessels. So right here is where you can see the massing <clears throat> of the fishing fleets that are harvesting all the fish out of the uh, South Pacific Ocean. Um, however, we're not gonna worry about that today. Uh, you get further down on the planet, and you get around the rim of Antarctica and suddenly it thins out a lot, even though it's summer down there. Shackleton made it on endurance about this far down when he got trapped in the ice. So this is pretty far down. And you go over here, the expedition yachts, the expedition cruise ships are generally gonna be working this turf here. Now the furthest south of these, um, I just zeroed in on a uh, pleasure craft that was down here. So you, you would expect that that might be legend or, or one of the really rugged uh, expedition vessels. Let me show you what it is. It's the 60 foot Rusark Aurora, which is uh, registered as a whale watching boat. 
and they take um, guests down into the ice and into Antarctica. It's a steel hulled vessel, very rugged, but um, perhaps surprising to see a boat like that that far south. And with that hull shape, should they be caught in the ice, like Endurance and Shackleton, um, it has a uh, wine glass hull shape and in fact it would pop out of the ice and survive being trapped in the ice. There may be some other circumstances that would cause them not to survive. However, um, let's get back on task here. And so, so if you look at all the fleets on the, in, in, in the world and what their mission is and what they're doing, the commercial ships are crossing oceans and they're doing that uh, you know, 15, 20 times a year, uh, they are crossing major oceans. The yachts, on the other hand, traditionally are going to be uh, in the Mediterranean and on the east coast of the United States and in the Caribbean. Now you start to see all these pink items. So that is the main thoroughfare between Europe and the Caribbean that the yachts are passing on. If you look at the migratory patterns of large yachts, they'll spend the summer in the Med or Northern Europe and they are probably no more than uh, 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers between any ports. Uh, their big passage twice a year is down here to sprint across the Atlantic. That's a passage just with crew on board, not with owners and guests. Then once they hit the Caribbean, you have the string of islands. So they're never very far away from a safe port or an island or a uh, water hookup, an electrical hookup. So the bulk of yachting activities, uh, even for the largest yachts, is short distance cruising. And it's not, ex it's not what we now consider expedition cruising or ocean voyaging. This is not to say that state-of-the-art luxury mega yachts are not superb vessels for the mission that they were built for. They uh, eliminate all sorts of motion from the sea with zero speed stabilizers. They have swimming pools so that you don't have to uh, go and uh, actually dip into the ocean. They have lots of large screen TVs to entertain you day and night. They have lots of power to get you there in a hurry if it's a short distance. And on top of that, uh, if you watch Below Decks, uh, the crew also provides all kinds of entertainment. An expedition yacht, on the other hand, clearly has a different mission. It should be capable of making a five to 10,000 mile passage and still carry enough fuel and supplies to endure for 30 to 60 days at sea. It will have redundant systems, but also have plenty of spares and workshops to be making repairs while on the mission. The crew will be well trained in passage making and taking care of their ship and not focus so much on entertaining the guests. The larger expedition yachts will not just have a helipad, but they'll have a hangar with refueling capabilities and the capacity to bring along pilots, along with submersibles and four-wheel drive vehicles and landing craft. These vessels also will often have moon pools and facilities for complex diving, including decompression chambers and nitrox equipment. Mega yachts are always shown in sunny weather and calm seas. But the ocean is not always so kind and you may not have the option of staying in the marina and watching a movie. Out here, zero speed stabilizers, luxury and sumptuousness will not be your friend. Out here, you need a seaworthy ocean tested vessel. For the last 30 years, the commercial shipping industry has been building offshore vessels that size-wise overlap the largest yachts coming out of Ocean Cove, Lursen, Blumenvoss, and Amels, to name a few. A great number of the vessels in the commercial fleet built during this time fulfill the mission of what we expect today in a long-range expedition yacht. And I'm gonna cite a few examples, and in the links below, you'll uh, be able to access some information on some of the vessels that I'm talking about. Uh, in particular, I'm going to show some of the ones that were chosen by Icon Yachts in Holland who are leading the pack in terms of shipyards that are doing uh, exemplary conversions. This 85-meter survey ship became Ocean Explorer. This 77-meter Russian-built icebreaker became the yacht giant and then was later transformed into the expedition yacht legend. Icon's latest conversion project is this one, the Ocean Tess 
which is a 63 meter Ulstein designed anchor handler that operates in the North Sea. And here's a preliminary conversion rendering from Espen Oino, who also did Octopus and the 600 foot Rev project in Norway. So there are basically two styles of commercial vessels that are ideal for conversion. One is the OSV, which has got a large heavy load bearing open aft deck. The bridge and all the crew accommodations are up forward. You might look at it as the equivalent of a flatbed truck. Naval architects like it because they can build after the main pilot house and construct the new guest accommodations, the helicopter hangar, any other customizations that the new owner requires for his or her mission. Another popular platform for conversion, and you can find some of these that have ice class, are the Ulstein designed anchor handling tugs. This particular one, the UT722, is a big sister to the 719R that Icon is currently doing a the conversion The anchor handlers tend to have more horsepower and more speed, and if they're ice class, they may even have six to 8,000 horsepower. But the conversion process is similar. You can see here that they build aft from the existing pilot house and bridge, and there's plenty of options on the configurations. Here you see it with two helipads, one of them with a hanger. So that wraps up part four, and uh, I hope that was useful. I, in part five, I will get to these new builds of expedition yachts, and uh, I'm just gonna leave with a parting shot of the Rusark Aurora. This is the 60-foot steel hull uh, Russian expedition yacht and that is also an example of the right boat for the mission. This week they were further south than any of the large expedition yachts or the expedition uh, special cruise ships that were plying that trade into the Antarctic. So uh, congratulations to Rusark Aurora and there's a link to them uh, in the notes below so go check it out and I'll see you again in part five here on the Yacht Channel.